Well, good morning. I promise my name is still Adam, not James Earl Jones, but I'm here today and I'm glad that you are too. And uh, anyway, uh, I am so glad that you have joined us for worship today. Uh, we are going to be, uh, we, we finished the book of Jeremiah last week and in our sermon series. And so today we're going to take a brief look um, and depending on how my voice feels, it may be briefer than brief. We'll have to see. And, uh, but I'm glad that you are here today because we're going to be looking at a passage out of Luke 18 uh, where we are going to talk about a little tiny parable that Jesus tells the disciples um, about uh, humility. And uh, I'm excited to talk about it today. A couple quick things before we jump into that. The first is, as always, please grab a Connect card. Uh, if you haven't, uh, you can use these to let us know, uh, you know, if any of your information has changed. If you're new with us, we'd love to know that so that I can follow up and say thanks for worshiping with us. You can let us know any prayer requests on the back of this card. Um, I, I say this every week, and uh, we really do believe that God answers prayer. Um, I would value your prayers this week. Uh, we are going to be traveling this coming weekend. If I can talk, we get. Uh, it's, it's like I'm back in puberty. It's wonderful, you know, talk about humility. But anyway, uh, this weekend coming up, we're going to be uh, traveling for my brother's wedding. And uh, we value, uh, you know, prayers of safety as well that, you know, I'm supposed to like be a little bit involved in the wedding. So this could be interesting, right? Something to remember. We'll have to see. Anyway, please pray for my family as we go through, uh, as we travel for that. And uh, be in prayer as well. I'm excited for Tom Jones. He's going to be preaching next week. So be covering Tom in prayer as he prepares to speak to you for the first time uh, since COVID. Uh, and uh, uh, say hello to him for me. With all that said, uh, I'm going to stop talking. Uh, so I'm going to pray. And then we're going to be led in some scripture reading, some prayer, some singing. I'll preach for however long I can. And, uh, and then we will uh, sing again before joining the Lord at the table. Uh, together. So would you join me in prayer? Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you promise. Make us love what you command through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning will be from Joel chapter 2, verses 23 through 32. O children of Zion, be glad and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the later rain as before. The threshing floor shall be full of grain. The vats shall overflow, overflow with wine and oil. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter. My great army, which I sent against you, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I, the Lord, am your God, and there is no other. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Then afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even the male and female slaves in those days, I will pour out my spirit. I will show portions in the heavens and on earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivor, survivors shall those whom the Lord calls. The response reading this morning is from Psalm chapter 65. I'll read the regular print and you respond with the underline. You are to be praised, O God, in Zion. To you shall bow the in Jerusalem. To you that hear prayer shall all flesh come. Because of their transgressions. Our sins are stronger than we are. But you will blot them out. 
Happy are they whom you choose and draw to your courts to dwell there. They will be satisfied by the beauty of your house, by the holiness of your temple. Awesome things will you show us in your righteousness, O God of our salvation. O Lord of all the ends of the earth and of the seas that are far away. You make fast the mountains by your power. You still the roaring of the seas. The roaring of their waves and the clamor of the peoples. Those who dwell at the ends of the earth will tremble at your marvelous signs. You make the dawn and the dust to sing for joy. You visit the earth and water it abundantly, and you you make it very plenteous. The river of God is full of water. You prepare the grain. You drench the furrows and smooth out the ridges. With heavy rain, you soften the ground and bless its increase. You crown the year with your goodness. And your paths overflow with plenty. May the fields of the wilderness be rich for grazing. And the hills be clothed with joy. May the meadows cover themselves with flocks, and the valleys cloak themselves with grain. Let them shout for joy. Would you pray with me? Lord, I ask that you would open our minds and our hearts uh, to receive what you would say to us today, Lord, that we would not only hear, but accept and understand what you have to teach us, Lord. Lord, I ask that you'd be with each and every one of us today. Just lead God, direct, and protect us. But most importantly, Lord, that your will would be done in each and, one of, each and every one of our lives, Lord. In your glorious name that I pray, Lord God. Amen. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you.
is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. I know who goes before me, I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by always by my side. You may be seated. <clears throat> Made sure to bring my, uh, my tea up with me so that I can, you know, wet my throat occasionally. We are going to be in uh, Luke chapter uh, 18 today. It's a short little section of scripture where Jesus tells an even shorter parable. He told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. The tax collector standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went, home, went down to his home justified rather than the other, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. In one of my all-time favorite movies, Star Wars, Episode Six: Return of the Jedi, which is the original number three, you know, before George Lucas went back and decided to make three more and then sold the... Anyway, Return of the Jedi, the one with the little Ewoks, okay? In that movie, near the end, the Empire, the Galactic Empire, run by Darth Sidious and Darth Vader, they have lured the, uh, the Rebel Alliance into a trap. The Rebel Alliance thinks that it is time to attack the second Death Star. In fact, at one point, they say, the time for our attack has come. Many Bothans died to give us this information. Would you like the whole movie quoted? I won't do that. Anyway, in the film, they're flying their fleet of spacecraft towards this Death Star. Their intellect, their intel says the Death Star is not yet operational. It's only being defended by a small little shield on this nearby moon. If we deactivate the shield, the spaceship, or the, the space station, the Death Star, will be vulnerable. And then, of course, there's this scene in the film where Emperor Palpatine, he looks at, Darth, uh, he looks at Luke Skywalker and says, witness the full firepower of this fully armed and operational battle station. At which point... The Death Star springs to life and destroys a massive spaceship in the kind of special effects that Star Wars made famous. Now, just before that moment, Lando Calrissian is flying the Millennium Falcon towards the Death Star. And he realizes, as he's talking with his co-pilot, that they're jamming them. He says, "How? why would they be jamming us if they didn't know that we are coming? And in that moment, he realizes a trap has been sprung and they are in trouble. And then we get this, my favorite clip from the whole movie. If it plays. It's a trap. That's it. That, that quote right there, one of my favorites. It's a trap, yells a fish man. I just, Star Wars is wonderful, isn't it? It's a trap. It's a trap. Now, of course... It's a movie. The good guys win. They, they navigate around the trap. Why am I talking about this? Well, as you may have guessed, there's a trap in our text today. Did you catch it? We're used to the Pharisees, to the scribes, luring Jesus in 
for a trap. I mean, Scripture tells us all over they were seeking to trap him. Here in this parable, Jesus does what they've been trying to do to him. He sets a trap. He baits it. And right when they think they know how it's going to end, he springs the trap. Let's, let's read the, the parable again, and, and, and we'll see if we can catch it. The parable, uh, two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying, God, thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. The tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast which is a sign of lament, I guess. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Did you catch the trap? Here's what I mean. In Jesus' day, he's taught, we're told he's talking to people who think they are great, who think they're something. He's talking to people who think, I'm the guy, I'm the person. They think of themselves as better than other people, that they themselves have been righteous because of what they do. So Jesus tells them a parable about a man who thinks that he is righteous. He says the two people go up to the temple to pray. One of them is a Pharisee. Now, it's important for us to understand. We, as Christians, we live with some Christian baggage that looks down on Pharisees without question. That would not have necessarily been the case in Jesus' time. These people, they look up to the Pharisees. These Pharisees, they fast twice a day. And this one in the parable gives his tithes. What this means is that he's not a hypocrite. He's doing what he tells people to do. This is important. This is an upstanding Pharisee. Except for, except for the content of his prayer. God, thank you. Thank you. I'm not like that person who, who robs houses. Thank you that I'm not like the adulterer, that person who, you know, gives their body freely. Thank you, Lord, that I'm not even like this tax collector who's standing far away from me beating his breast. I'm not immoral like him. Thank you, Lord, he says. Now, here's the trap in Jesus' day. Okay, the trap is that these people would have associated themselves more with the Pharisee. We are upstanding people. Some of these people he's talking to may be Pharisees. They would have associated with the guy who's righteous, who's doing it all right, and not those hated tax collectors who can't even look up to heaven. They would have associated with the Pharisee. And then what does Jesus say? He says, the tax collector says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy on me. For I have sinned. And Jesus says, the tax collector is the one who went home justified. Not by what he did, right? Not by fasting twice a week, not by giving his tithes, but by confessing his sin. The tax collector went home justified. The mousetrap has sprung. These people in Jesus' day, they're, they're looking around like, wait a minute. The tax collector can go home justified. But what are we talking about here? But the amazing thing with scripture is that even today, Jesus is able to lay a trap for us. And if we're not careful, our fingers get snapped on it just like the people in our story today. I mentioned that, you know, here we as Christians, we live with some, with some Christian baggage where we, we look down upon the Pharisees almost unquestioningly. And then, of course, a Pharisee does something like this and we think, man, that guy really messed up, didn't he? And if we're not careful, we find ourselves reading this passage and we find ourselves saying, thank God I'm not like that Pharisee. The trap has sprung. If we're not careful, we do the same thing that the Pharisee did. We just do it with a different target. We don't say, thank God I'm not like the tax collector. Maybe you say that too, I don't know. But, but thank God I'm not like that Pharisee, we say. I don't pray those prayers. 
I don't fast twice a week. I don't give a tenth of my, maybe I'm in the wrong here. But, you know, we, we say, thank God I'm not like the Pharisee. I'm not judgmental. I don't think I justify myself. I'm not at odds with Jesus. Thank God I am not like that Pharisee. But you know what? I think that we're more like that Pharisee than we want to admit. There's a pastor uh, who was interviewed not too long ago, and she said, uh, this is her quote, she said, the drug of choice today is knowing who we are better than. The drug of choice today is knowing who we're better than. Ouch. I don't care what the news tells you. The drug of choice today is not fentanyl. It's not heroin. It's not even weed. I think she's right. The thing that gets us the most excited, the thing that gets us the highest is knowing I am better than them. And in that moment, Jesus tells us a story about a Pharisee and a tax collector where the Pharisee says, thank God I'm not like them. And the trap has been sprung. And maybe you don't believe me. Well, let me give you a couple examples of, of, of places. These don't, this is not us. I'm talking about other Christians and other churches, right? <laughs> Thank God I'm not a Catholic with the Pope. Thank God I'm not a mainliner. They're too political. Thank God I'm not the charismatics. Their churches are too weird. I don't like those services. Thank God I'm not a parent like that who lets their kids do, say, think that. Maybe you remember being in college and going, thank God I'm not a student like that. Thank God I don't vote like that. Thank God I don't think that. Thank God I don't live like that person. I'm just going to say it. I think that this trap springs on our lives today more often than it doesn't. Maybe I'm just more sinful than you. Got no amens there, so I'm happy. You know, if, if you're asking me what the biggest problem in America today. Maybe I could even be more specific. The biggest problem with American politics and leadership today is that everybody thinks they're better than the person who sits next to them. Everybody says, thank God I'm not like that. Thank God those people are not my constituents. Thank God I didn't vote like that. Thank God I'm not like that, we say. And I think in this moment, Jesus tells us a parable. Now, we have to be careful here, okay? My point is not go home and be like a tax collector, <laughs> Go home and cheat your friends out of their money, right? Because that's what they did, right? So we have to be a little careful. But I do think that what Jesus is telling us a parable about here today, what Jesus is telling us today, what Jesus is inviting us to today is Jesus says, do not seek to exalt yourself. Let God exalt you. Um, some of you know that my dear friend Roy Lawson was in this week. Uh, he, he, he talked uh, at our Wednesday night class this last week. And by the way, um, I have a recording of that uh, that I will email you out uh, because of some of the sensitive information he shared about his own family. He didn't want me to post that just straight to our website. So I'll, I'll email you that and I'd love for you to take a listen to what he had to say. But as, as he was here this week, we were talking about you know, he was encouraging me about leading a church and about being a pastor and, 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 and how to set up good habits. And one of the things that I'm so glad he said to me was, Adam, I want you to be more 
than you seem. What he meant was, let, thing, let part of your ministry be done in the background. Let part of your ministry be done behind a curtain where nobody sees, where nobody knows the influence that you're having on specific people or things or whatever. He said, unfortunately, too many ministers in our, in our churches these days, they want to seem more than they are. Appear less than you are. What he's saying is be humble. Be contrite. Don't make a big deal about all the things that you've done. Stick your flag in the ground. Be okay with a resume that doesn't list every single thing you've done. That was his encouragement to me. But I think, by the way, that that encouragement is good for any Christian. Be more than you seem. Don't seek to exalt yourself. It's never going to work. At least not for very long. The people who seek to exalt themselves are often the ones that one, one domino falls and the rest come tumbling down. So Jesus says, don't exalt yourself. Think of yourself properly. There's a reason that the earliest, we think, you know, Philippians 2, we think might be one of the earliest um, hymns of the church. There's a reason that hymn makes a very specific claim that Jesus did what is unnatural for humanity. Jesus did not seek to exploit power. Instead, he gave up what power he had and humbled himself into the form of a slave, is what Philippians says. Wow. You see, Jesus is modeling for us the way of the Christian, the one who seems less than they are, the one who does not seek to exalt themselves, the one who recognizes their own faults. I think that ultimately is the big point here. See, the Pharisee looks around and goes, God, thanks. Thanks. I have no problems. I'm not like those people with problems. In fact, I'm better than those people because I fast twice a week, Monday and Thursday. I give a tenth of my stuff away. Thank you, God, that I have no problems. But the tax collector says, God, I've got big problems. Forgive me. Forgive me. Be merciful to me. And Jesus says, God was merciful to him. So the, the, the take home today is not go be a tax collector. <laughs> we still don't like those people, right? They didn't like them then. We don't like them now. The point is be contrite. Acknowledge your sin. You know, this, this idea of humbling yourself is all over the New Testament. One of my favorite passages is this one from James chapter 4. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will exalt you. Now, I will confess to you that if my voice was not what it is, I would have sung the hymn that you may know to those words. Beautiful old hymn. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Don't try to lift yourself up. You lift yourself up, you're going to get pushed over. But if God lifts you up, whew, nobody, nobody can strip you of that. So how do we foster this kind of, right? So, okay, great. Go be contrite and humble. But I've already said that I think that the human condition doesn't want to do that. Take another drink after that little. There are three spiritual disciplines that I think will help. Now, it is my conviction that the spiritual disciplines, all of them are helpful. So I'm not saying only these three. But I think with this issue, there are three spiritual disciplines that if we do them regularly, they may help. They will not justify us, right? Right? The Pharisee is very clear. The disciplines themselves, they will not justify you. 
but they might help you think of yourself more properly. The first is that I think solitude is so important. If the only time that you are with God is at church, if the only time that you are with God is with other people, which are good things, by the way, those are good things. But if those are the only time that you're going to be with God, you're going to constantly compare yourself to other people. Thank God I don't think like that. Or worse, are they judging me because I think this way? Both of those ends of the spectrum are harmful to your relationship with Jesus. So my encouragement to you is to spend time alone with God where God can speak to you and God can remind you that you are a beloved child of God, that you have value to him. That while you are a sinner, you are loved. The second practice is meditation. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, folding your, 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 your feet and, you know, oh, I'm clearing your mind. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about meditating on the promises of God. I'm talking about opening your Bible Finding, you know, read the Psalms and meditate on what they have to say about God's love for you. I'm talking about you, you open your Bible to a passage like this and you just sit with it. Ask God to reveal for you the, the promise that he has. Also, when you're in those group settings and you find yourself saying, thank God I'm not like them, meditate on those moments. I will confess to you, it has been a hard season of parenting for me. I want to raise children who are bold, take that hill kind of people, and yet that makes parenting very hard. <coughs> and I will confess to you that I do not always know how to react. And one of the most helpful things for me has been to meditate on what I am doing and the kind of parent that I want to be and asking God to help me get rid of the bad and become a better good. Meditation in that sense is critical to helping see ourselves the way that God sees us. Now the third spiritual discipline is the act of confession. Now, I know that we're Protestant and confession gets weird, right? We don't, now, I'm also not asking you to come stop by my office and I'm going to sit there at the window and make you talk to me. That's not what I'm saying. If you want to confess your sins to me, I, I mean, we can have that talk, I guess, but that's not what I'm saying. I am saying what the tax collector models is a recognition of guilt and a plea for mercy. God, I am a sinner. I may not think like that, but I think like that. And that's just as anti-gospel as this. God promises to justify those who come and ask for forgiveness. Now, I will say that I think confession to other people is still a valuable thing. Okay? I'm not saying the only way for you to get forgiveness is to confess to me or to an elder or any of that. But especially if I recognize I have sinned against you, it can be incredibly helpful for me to come and say, I confess that I have sinned against you and I'm sorry for that. Will you forgive me? I recognize this sin in my life. I need help. Will you help me not be like this anymore? Those are valuable conversations to have with trusted people, right? Don't just walk into the greeter on Sunday morning and go, let me confess my sins to you. That's not what I'm saying. But find people you trust who you can have real conversations with. Sometimes I have found that while I am not, you know, I'm not God, just so you know, while the power to forgive sins is Jesus and God's alone, there have been moments in my life where I have confessed either my sin to a friend or trusted advisor 
or someone has confessed their sin to me. And the ability to remind them that God has forgiven them. Sometimes they need to hear the words from a person. I'm not the one doing the forgiving. I'm just the one proclaiming the good news that forgiveness is here. Sometimes that's really helpful. So I encourage you to find time to be alone, to meditate, and to confess your sins. For the record, those three things can happen at the same time, right? Uh, you can do all three of those things together. But each of them on their own holds value in seeing ourselves the way that God sees us. So I, I told you that Roy was here this week. He opened his lecture on our, um, he, he was talking about the kind of church that Westwood is a part of, the independent Christian church, and why at 85, he's still a member of this body. And he opened with a poem. This is the poem he wrote. He, he, he didn't write it, sorry. Poem he read, written by Edwin Markham. The poem reads, he drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that let him in. You see, one of the things that will happen when we see ourselves properly, when we recognize our own sin, when we recognize that Jesus has forgiven us, is that we won't say, thank God I'm not like that person. Instead, we will say, thank God you forgave me and have given me the power to forgive them. Now, what that means is that one of the things that will draw a community together, one of the things that will draw a church to unity, one of the things that will draw a, a city, a nation, whatever, to unity is the willingness to love and forgive each other instead of seeing ourselves as better than them. We've all got our stuff. We've all got reasons that other people could draw a circle that shuts us out. Agape love, the kind of love that Jesus shows to us, is the circle we can draw that includes them in our world. Thank God for that person is the Christian response to thank God I'm not like that person. Each person, we're told, is made in the image of God. Even this Pharisee who thinks he's better than a tax collector. In uh, this, this idea of, of uh, you know, unity and, and love is apparently really important to Jesus' disciples, because in 1 Peter, we find this passage. Finally, all of you, have unity of spirit, sympathy, love for one, of one another, a tender heart, and a humble mind. You see, what, what Peter is saying is that when we begin to think of ourselves the way that we're supposed to, it's one of the critical pieces of unity and sympathy and compassion. I can't have compassion on you very well if I think I'm better than you, right? That's just virtue signaling. So I want us to be a people, and by the way, I think, I'm not saying we're not, right? But I'm encouraging us to, to live into this calling of Jesus that says, think of yourself the way that you are, ask for forgiveness of your sins, and love the people who stand next to you in spite of what our nature wants us to think about ourselves over them. Jesus invites you to the countercultural habit of humility and loving the person next to you. Let's pray. Thank you, God. First off, God, thank you for preserving my voice long enough to speak these words. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to do so today. I thank you, Lord, for the reminder that even I have moments where I think I'm better than other people. And that that is just not the way of Jesus. 
Jesus who was and is and will ever be the son of God saw us as so valuable, so loved that he gave his life for us, that he came to earth, lived a perfect life in spite of how messed up we are. And even as he died, he prayed for our forgiveness. God, we just thank you for the truth of your love in spite of the wreck that we are. I pray, Lord, that we would be people who see others as you see them, that we see ourselves the way that you see us, that we would not seek to exalt ourselves, but that we would humble ourselves before you. Lord, it is in Jesus' name I ask all these things. Amen. Uh, this song that we're going to sing is an invitation for all who are thirsty to come to Jesus. And I think it's important uh, to remember that before we can um, come to Jesus, we have to admit that we're thirsty and we have to admit our need to him, uh, our need for him. So if you'll please stand and we're going to sing the song as we prepare for communion. from Proverbs chapter 11, verses 2 to 4. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, 
with the humble is wisdom. The integrity of the upright guides them, but the crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. We all like to think of ourselves as humble and individuals of integrity, but this meal that we're going to share is a humbling meal for the people of God. It strikes at the very root of human pride. After all, God, God does not give us crumbs, but the very best of his children. In this memorial, we are reminded of the sacrifice of our Lord for us, and God is reminded of his promises to us through his Son, the promise to nurture us every time we meet as a body of worshipers. The table humbles sinners. The table instructs the humble by gracing them with this means. Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, died and rose again for our justification, that we should be seated at this table together with others justified saints, humbled by the cross and exalted by the resurrection. Will you pray with me? Thank you, Lord, that you humbled your son by his death on the cross. Help us, Lord, to humble ourselves, to acknowledge our sins, to confess them, and to realize that we are justified by faith in you. Thank you as we share in these elements. In Jesus' precious name, amen. the bread, symbolic of his body, broken for us. And the cup, symbolic of his blood, shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Amen. Thank you, Marianne. A couple things before we go today. First, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I will remind you that if you have a Connect card filled out, you can drop that in one of our offering boxes along with any tithe or gift that you have that you would like to give to Westwood. Let me tell you, I've been talking over the last couple of weeks about how we had a, 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 a Midville uh, Elementary reach out to us on behalf of a family. And they said, hey, we have a family that we know uh, doesn't have electricity at their house. We're trying to see if we can have some people who can donate to help. Westwood sent some money on ahead because we knew they needed it quickly. And we said, hey, we, we're, you know, anybody at Westwood who wants to, you know, give, you can mark that. And we'll, you know, that, that kind of helps, uh, you know, with our budget and getting them the money that they needed and whatnot. Thank you to everybody who's done that. I wanted to read a letter that we got um, I'm going to post this on our uh, community uh, bulletin board, but I'm going to read it. Um, I will confess I almost cried. So, permission granted. Dear Westwood Christian Church, thank you for your swift help to get our students' power back on. One of the students has an upcoming birthday, and their wish was to get the family's power back on. Thank you for helping make this birthday wish come true. Signed, Shea, the Midvale social worker. You know, a couple weeks ago, I preached on uh, seeking the shalom of the city in which we live. And if that's not it, I don't know what is. Uh, money has been tight in my family before, but never so tight that I didn't know if the electricity would be on for my birthday. So I want, to, I want you to hear me say thank you for the way that you helped us bless a, a, a family in our community. I'll also tell you that my initial reaction went, I, I was like, well, the kid needs more than electricity for his birthday. So I reached out and uh, I said, hey, like, can, can you give me this kid's age so that I can buy a toy that I'll drop off at, at, at school? And you, I don't even need to know who they are. And I'll tell you that the, mid, the social worker emailed back and said, hey, really grateful for that. But, but just so you know, we actually signed them up for a nonprofit that, gives kids birthday presents and cakes if they can't afford it. And so I, I just want you to hear me say thank you 
for helping us as a church speak the good news of Jesus into the life of a family that says, we're glad you're here. We're sorry that you're dealing with this. Happy birthday. So uh, I'm going to tell you again that if, if, if you have something you'd like to give in order to help us kind of, you know, with, with what we've done already, you can indicate on a memo line of your check, you know, electricity for Midvale or, you know, something like that. And we'll get that into the line item that needs to go to. But thank you so much for your help making a kid's birthday wish come true. A couple other quick things that I'm going to tell you before we go. First, I'll remind you that there is a potluck today after, after service that'll be downstairs. Give us 10 to 15 minutes to kind of make sure that's all set up downstairs. Um, if you didn't sign up to bring food, you can't come. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Gotcha. Uh, Well, we'd love for you to come uh, and uh, hang around, spend some time. You won't talk to me. I'm telling you that now because I can't hardly talk to anybody right now. But uh, so I'll listen. I'm a great listener right now. Uh, Love to have you at the church potluck after, like I said, downstairs in the big room down there. Uh, Thank you to the people who are helping get all that set up as we speak. I already told you that next week Tom Jones is going to be preaching. I'm, I hope you'll be here and say hi to him. Um, but I'm also going to let you know that uh, it's a fifth Sunday next week. Um, and so it's an all-family worship for the, for the kids who are going to be here. Um, uh, we won't have children's uh, programming downstairs next week. Um, uh, it'll be up here. Uh, last uh, announcement. So she, Anne is not up here right now. Uh, last year, Anne came to me and said, hey, Adam, next year for Christmas... We should do this thing where people can pay for poinsettias to decorate the church. Um, And I said, that's a great idea. And so, believe it or not, it is October 23rd. I I can still talk barely. It's October 23rd, but we already have to think about poinsettias for Christmas. If you would like to purchase a poinsettia or more to help us decorate the church for Christmas, there is a sign-up sheet on the table in the lobby. Uh, We'll get that. That way I can put one order in at the, at the florist. We only pay for delivery once with however many poinsettias. And, and we'll handle, you know, getting payment and whatnot for that. Uh, there is the option to have those, you know, have ribbons on them. All that stuff is on the sign-up sheet. If you have questions, let me know. And maybe send me an email because I can email better than I can talk right now. And um, w- that way we together uh, can decorate our beautiful church. And uh, you'll also hear more, uh, you know, near the end of November, we will do some more church decorating uh, where I will invite you to be a part of that, uh, to kind of, you know, the hang the greens to get, uh, you know, all that stuff going. So anyway, poinsettia signups are on a table in the lobby. Would you please stand? And I'm going to read just a couple of verses from Romans to send us into our week. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, on the basis of God's mercy to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned to you. Go in peace. Well, eat in peace, whatever. We'll see you next week.